welcome everybody at Gainesville Church. Would you all stand? We're going to worship Jesus this morning. Come on, stand up. Sing sometimes. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a campus for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. Failure won't define me, so that's what my father does. And failure won't define me, so that's what my father does. Who lay your burdens down? Who here in the Father's house? And check that shame at the door. See they welcome many more. Who you're in the Father's house? Yeah. Sing arrival. And arrival's not the end game. The journey's where you are. You never want it perfect. You just want it my heart. And the story isn't over. If the story isn't good, if failure's never final, and the father's in. Listen, guys, I didn't get good sleep last night, so I need you guys to help me to sing and to praise Jesus this morning. Come on, we got to come alive a little bit. We're going to sing this together. Here we go. And prodigals come home, the helpless find hope. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Come on. And prison doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Singing love is on the move when the father's in the room. Oh, miracles take place, the cynical find faith, and love is breaking through when the father's in the room. And Jericho walls are quaking, and strongholds now are shaking. burdens down Ooh, here in the father's house check your shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the father's house come on sing this together it's honey in the rock water in the snow the manna on the ground no matter where I go and I don't need to worry now that I know everything I need you got there's honey in the rock praying for a miracle thirsty for the living well only you can satisfy Sweetness at the mercy seat. Now I've tasted, it's not hard to see. Only you can satisfy. There's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. There's 
honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. God, would you bow your heads and pray with me this morning, church? Lord Jesus, we thank you for a taste of that honey this morning. We thank you for your spirit flowing through this place and working in unbelievable ways. We pray it continues to do so through the rest of this service, Lord God. That we would know that you are real, you are very much here, and you are very much alive, Lord God. So we love you so much, we pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated, church. Good morning, good morning, and welcome everyone. Um, so I'm doing the announcements once again today. Third time's the charm. So <laughs> uh, the first thing on our announcements is the VBS registration. Um, if you guys haven't been listening, which you should be, it's July 10th to the 14th. Um, all right, there's three ways you guys can do this. You can volunteer and be a great member of this church, you know, be a teacher, help with kitchen, crafts, recreation, music. We need a lot of help. Um, the second one's the campers, obviously putting your kids in, rising kindergartners to rising fifth graders. Um, it's a lot of fun, but the space is filling up. And then the third thing is supplies. Donations are great. Um, you guys are pretty good with that, so, you know, let's keep it up. I'm on a streak here. Uh, the second thing is to ask Pastor John. Pastor John is doing his um, six-week class. It's starting tomorrow at 7 p.m., May 8th to June 12th. And then the last thing is the HOPE mission. So the HOPE mission has been going each year, except when COVID was a big thing. Um, and we've sent multiple teams to Ethiopia with the mission of providing clean water, 
um, education and building healthy communities. Um, the, we've installed over 200 water filters and provided over 3 million gallons of clean water to, in remote areas of Ethiopia. Um, and, a, and as well as a lot of building and schools for the 250 first generation students. And we're getting ready to send more teams and Pastor Benson is gonna be traveling to Ethiopia in a few weeks to finalize this plan. So round of applause for that. Yay, yay. Yes. So, you know, you can give on the website for the mission funds. Um, you could sign up and join for the next missions to come. Or obviously, like, you know, pray for Benson, the team, Ethiopia. Um, and any other information you may have, you can ask the desk at the front. Or you can just go online to our church website. Okay. Thanks, guys. Oh, yeah. Love, love a good applaud after the announcements at the church. That was awesome. Thanks, Carl. Well, can we just pray over Pastor Benson before he brings us a sermon? Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for Benson. We pray as he comes up here and he preaches your word, Lord God, that your scripture would come alive, that new things would come out of it that we didn't know even existed in there before, no matter how many times we've read through it, Lord God. We pray that your spirit would flow through Benson that what he speaks would not be of him, but it would be of you. That we would grow from those words, we would be convicted in ways that would help us to want to love and to be there for others more than we ever were, Lord. So we just love you so much. We pray this in your name. Amen. Two quick things. Uh, he keeps forgetting to introduce himself, but that's Carl, our ministry intern. So uh, if you see him, say hey. And He's the first person ever to get a round of applause for announcements. So. <laughs> it's got to be doing something right. So, The second thing is this. Uh, if you're a part of our church uh, email, you would have seen it this week. If not, um, I sent out a letter to our congregation regarding larger issues that are happening within our denomination uh, and a little bit about what that looks like for our church, what that means for our church, and how our leadership is handling that. Um, it's really simple. Uh, nothing's going to happen for at least a year. But we want to communicate with y'all as a church as best we can around that issue. So if you have not seen my letter, there are hard copies of it at the welcome desk. I would encourage you to pick that up and read it. As well as there are two information meetings on May 21st and June 4th here at the church at 2 o'clock. I will give you more information about this stuff than you ever wanted and um, answer any questions that you may have. But uh, between now and then, please know this, I am here. You can talk to me. Uh, I am happy to meet with you and answer any questions you might already have. We're gonna be, we're gonna get ahead of this issue and we're gonna communicate it well because I believe that the future of this church is bright. So. With that, let's jump into our scripture this morning. We're looking at Luke chapter 6, verses 32 through 36, and actually for the next four weeks, we're going to stay in just this passage of scripture. So this is what it says. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. And this is what we're focusing on this morning. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Like I said, for the next four weeks, we're going to look at this idea of what the Christian life is all about, uh, because I believe that, unfortunately, we live in a time in which people express themselves as followers of Jesus uh, all too often in subtle ways. But when you read through the scriptures, when you look through the scriptures, when you see how Jesus is calling us to live, uh, the Christian life is anything but subtle. And so I want to start this morning with, with a very simple question. Have you ever been, um, have you ever been confused uh, for someone you aren't? Have you ever been confused for somebody you aren't? Years and, and years ago, I was 
uh, traveling back home to visit my parents, and every time I go home to San Antonio, there's this really cool outdoor store in our, uh, in our area, and I make sure I, I go pay it a visit. And so the last time I was there, I'm looking through the racks of clothes. This woman comes up to me, she looks at me, she says, hey, um, do you mind giving me some help? I say, yeah, no problem. What, what do you need? And she says, do you know where the vests are? I say, yeah, because I've just been looking at it. I've just been looking at some new vest. I love vest. I'm a bit of a vest man, you know? Uh, and so poofy vest, furry vest, fleece vest. I, I don't wear sweater vests. That's where I draw the line. But uh, I say, yeah, they're, they're over here. And so we go over to the vest rack. She's like, oh, thank you so much. I'm like, yeah, I start to walk away. She goes, oh, can I get your opinion on some of these? I said, um, I guess, but I don't really know what I'm talking about. She's like, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't you work here? I look down. I'm wearing sort of like some rougher khaki pants, some outdoorsy looking shoes. I got a sweet flannel on. And I was like, and I look around at all the employees in the store. They're wearing the exact same thing I'm wearing. And I was like, no, I don't work here. And she became really awkward. I was just kind of resting in that awkwardness for a while. Uh, a few days later, my mom, she sends me to the grocery store. She says, can you pick up some groceries? Sure, I'll go grab some stuff. Stand in the local grocery store, looking at the aisle, or looking at the groceries in the aisle. This lady comes up to me. She says, sir, do you know where the spices are? I said, yeah, I do know where the spices are, actually. Uh, what are you looking for? She says, I'm looking for Vindaloo spice. I was like, oh, that's a rare one. I said, that's going to be found over here. And she says, really? I said, yeah, here, I'll walk you there. So I walk her over there. Right? We get there. And then she says, um, do you know where the canned vegetables are? And I was like, I have no idea where the canned vegetables are. She says, how do you not know where the canned vegetables are? I was like, I don't work here. And she was like, what? I looked down. I'm wearing jeans, black polo shirt, black fleece vest. It all revolves around the vest, right? And I realized, hey, that's what all the employees are wearing around here. I said, no, I used to work here. That's how I knew where the spices were, but I don't work here anymore. And she was like, huh. And she got awkward, uncomfortable. I rested in the awkward. It was great, right? We all make judgments or assumptions about people based on how we see them, how we dress, what they look like. We make connections purely based on sight. Jesus tells us, or, or Paul writes rather, in Colossians 3, he tells us to clothe ourselves, to clothe ourselves with a, a variety of things. One of the things he talks about is the very thing that Jesus talks about in Luke 6, to clothe ourselves in mercy, to clothe ourselves in compassion, to clothe ourselves in forgiveness. The real question for us this morning, the challenge for us, is when people look at us, do they even see those things? Do they even see those things? I think the reality is uh, no. I think unfortunately we live in a way, we might be forgiving people, we might be compassionate people, we might be merciful people, but we aren't living in a way where people see that in us. And I'll tell you why that is, because I, I think it's really common, really obvious. I think it's because forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is hard. It is not easy for us as people to forgive each other. There are a variety of reasons for this, but the first of which is, I don't think we think enough about the mercy and compassion that God has for us, right? In Luke 6, 35 through 36, which I already read, it says, uh, but God is kind to the wicked and the ungrateful. He shows them mercy, and then we're told to show mercy as our Father has shown us mercy. In other words, our ability to have compassion, forgiveness, and mercy is always predicated off of God showing us compassion and forgiveness and mercy. The problem is when we don't think about that enough, we lose self-awareness. We lose our self-awareness, and instead uh, we choose not 
to forgive others because we've forgotten that we ourselves have been forgiven. The second thing that I think makes forgiveness so hard is that we live in a time and we live in a broken and a hurting world that tells us that in order to forgive somebody, in order to have mercy on somebody, in order to have compassion on somebody, the first thing that has to happen is they need to show contrition. They need to, sh to accept the fact that they're wrong. They need to come forward. They need to ask for it. They need to beg for it. And it's only when it's being sought that we can give it. It's only when people are seeking forgiveness that we should give forgiveness. But what Colossians 3 says, if you read through it right before he talks about how you clothe yourself, is he says that if anyone has anything against somebody else, they should forgive them. In other words, the forgiveness is not offered once someone seeks it, but the forgiveness is offered once the person who's going to be giving it even realizes that they should give it. That the moment that there is conflict is the moment that forgiveness is offered, not when someone's come begging and seeking it. Right? This is all built around this idea that if we're just being completely honest with ourselves, we want to be right and we love it when others are wrong and we get to stick it to them. Matthew 18, verse 21, Peter asked Jesus this crazy question. He says, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? Seven times? And Jesus responds back, 77 times. It's not about do you literally have to forgive somebody 77 times. It's about the fact that Peter, Peter was like, listen, just tell me how many times I have to forgive him so I can stop. Right? We like it. When people are wrong, and we are right. A few days ago, uh, Alicia, my wife, and I were having this conversation, very heated debate in our family, about what time exactly does Maverick go down for a nap while he's at school? And if you don't have a, kid in, a little kid in school nowadays, let me tell you what, there's this app, and it, like you can just track his day. You can just follow his day all day long. I don't look at it at all because I don't really care. He's at school, so I don't have to think about him. Now, my wife, because she's way more loving than I am, is like, check, 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 right? She is up to date. I said, he goes to bed at school, he goes down for his nap at school around 12.30. She's like, no, it's closer to 1.30. I said, no, it's not. Look at his daily report in the noon hour nap. She's like, that is a rare occurrence. I'm like, I see this every single day. So we put Maverick down for a nap. We both get the app out. We're like, let's test it, right? First day. It's like, oh, Maverick went down for his nap at 12.38. I'm like, point for Benson. Thank you very much, right? Then she's like, let's look at another day. We go back a day. Oh, Maverick went down for his nap at 1.10. She's like, point for Alicia. Next day, Maverick went down at 1.15. Point for Alicia. Previous day, Maverick went down at 12.50, point for Benson, right? We went back like three weeks to figure out who was right and who was wrong. It's important stuff, knowing what hour my child naps at school, right? Turns out I was entirely wrong. I just picked a lucky week, but generally it's like I'm 100% in the wrong. We, we love when someone's wrong to be like, ha ha. We stick it to them. And the final reason I think we are so bad at forgiveness that we struggle, we struggle to offer forgiveness and mercy and compassion is that we don't realize that we are poisoning our souls. And that actually, the longer we don't forgive, the harder and harder and harder it becomes to forgive. You see, our ability to forgive becomes a spiritual callous upon our heart. Our 
inability to forgive becomes a spiritual callous upon our heart. Or worse yet, when I think what happens, is we begin to show favoritism and partiality to those whom we forgive. So we have a group of people in our lives that we're closer to than anybody else, and, and for them, forgiveness is readily available. But it's not for everybody else. And so we convince ourselves that because we're so ready to forgive over here, there's nothing wrong with us. But that is a delusion that makes it impossible for us to realize how calloused our hearts and our souls have become. In James, two verse, cha in James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13, James talks about this idea of partiality within the faith, of favoritism within the faith. And his overarching point is simply that when we show partiality into our faith, we think of it as us being faithful, and yet it is actually only an expression of us being unfaithful. Right? To choose who gets love, to choose who gets grace, to choose who gets forgiveness is completely counter to the way that God freely offers love and grace and forgiveness and mercy to each and every single person. And so over time, this callous just begins to develop and harden around our hearts. Right? What, what happens is, right, the thought of the person, the thought of the situation, the thought of the one who needs forgiveness does not actually develop within us good thoughts. I have people in my life who all the time are in need of forgiveness. And what I find over and over and over again is that when I choose not to forgive them, right, not only do they stay on my mind, but when I think of them, it is not accompanied by good and righteous and godly thought, but rather the things that accompany the thought of the person who's so in need of forgiveness are thoughts of frustration and anger and anxiety. Right? That as I think of them, I actually find myself getting worked up more and more and more and more. Why? Because forgiveness isn't being offered, the heart is being calloused, and the thoughts that are, that are forming the callous around the hearts are not godly thoughts. Right? Eventually, it just becomes such a distraction that you think of the person right, who's hurt you, who's wronged you, who's annoyed you, who's frustrated you, who's done something you didn't like, right? And you think about them so much that you then begin to lose sight of yourself. Because let's be honest, it's far easier to point out somebody else's mistakes than to spend the time looking in the mirror and dealing with our own. And so over time, not only do you have ungodly thoughts forming, not only are you distracted from your own life, but eventually you begin to form grudges and resentment that become a burden and a weight on your life. And the craziest part of this whole thing of not offering forgiveness is that the person who has hurt you, the person who has wronged you, the person who has upset you, frustrated you, done something that you didn't like, why you are thinking and stewing and building resentment, that person is spending zero time caring. I truly believe that in 99% of the cases, the person you need to forgive either doesn't think they need to be forgiven or could care less. Luke 23, verse 34, and Acts 7, verse 59, basically the same exact thing is said. The first is Jesus dying on the cross. He looks around, and he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Acts 7 is, Pete, is Stephen, 
Stephen is being stoned to death. And he says in the midst of people killing him by throwing rocks at him, forgive them, Lord. They know not what they do. In other words, the people in need of forgiveness are not even aware they're in need of forgiveness. What that should tell us, what that should inform us, is forgiveness is not actually about the person in need of forgiveness, but forgiveness is about us, the people who need to give forgiveness. Forgiveness is about you and me being willing to offer it, not about people becoming contrite and begging for it. Why is this, right? Why, why is forgiveness not actually about the wrongdoer, but about the one who needs to give it? I think there are three simple solutions to this. The first is rather obvious. God is good, and he doesn't want you or me walking around being miserable. Right? We know that when we don't offer forgiveness to people, it affects not them, it affects our lives. And turns out, God doesn't want you to be miserable with your life. You see, those people, as I've already said, begin to plague our minds. But the reason, the reason you can't get them out of your mind, the reason you can't stop thinking about them, is because you haven't gotten them out of your heart first. The reason you can't stop thinking about the people you need to forgive is because you haven't gotten them out of your heart first. God understands that when we choose to forgive without the person even asking for it, it doesn't just free our heart, but it frees our mind. The second thing is this. Forgiveness is teachably contagious. Forgiveness is teachably contagious. In other words, I have found in my own life that when someone has done something to wrong me or upset me or that I don't agree with, when I choose to offer forgiveness, I discover it feels good. And it makes me want to offer forgiveness more and more and more and more. Eventually, you begin to offer forgiveness so much and discover how good it feels, how freeing it feels, what a burden is removed by offering forgiveness, that you begin to believe in it. And then eventually, you run into somebody in your life who's struggling with somebody, who's struggling with an issue, who's struggling with a relationship, and all of a sudden you have been positioned in a place to say, have you tried forgiving them? And when they look at you like you're crazy, you have a way of saying, I've done this in my life over and over and over and over again. They start trying it out. They think it feels pretty good too. Forgiveness is teachably contagious. And eventually what happens is that we practice it on earth because we've experienced it from our Heavenly Father. And the person you share that thought with begins to experience it on earth so that they can begin to imagine it coming from their Heavenly Father. And the final point is this simple. It's out of our scripture this morning. It says, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. Ultimately, the most important point, the reason we are called to offer forgiveness is ultimately because it is a reflection of who God is. Forgiveness is ultimately a reflection of who God is. The Christian life, a life of following Jesus, is a life of radical 
forgiveness, and mercy. Because our Father in heaven has extended to us an infinite amount of forgiveness and mercy. We can offer forgiveness and mercy in a way you need to offer forgiveness and mercy in a way that sometimes you don't even have to tell the person you have forgiven. Because the reality is this. We all have people in our lives that we need to forgive. We have people in our lives who have hurt us deeply who have done serious wrong to us. And let me be abundantly clear about this. You offering them forgiveness is not saying what they have done to you is okay. It is still absolutely wrong. There are people in your life who have done what I would call downright evil to you. It is not excusing what they have done, but it is still offering forgiveness. There are people in our lives today who have said things we disagree with, who believe things we disagree with, who have pushed points we've disagreed with. It has upset us. It has irked us. It has sent us off an edge. It has filled us with frustration and anger. And in the name of Jesus Christ, you need to forgive them. There are people in your life who have taken action against you that they shouldn't have taken. There are people in your life that have made decisions about you that they shouldn't have made. There are people in your life that have hurt you, that have wounded you, that have caused you pain, that have lingered in your heart and in your soul, and what they have done to you is wrong. But guess what? In the name of Jesus Christ, you need to forgive them. You don't need to forgive them for them. You need to forgive them for you. Because at the end of the day, this is a room, myself included, full of people who have done things wrong, full of people who have frustrated others, who have said things others disagree with, who have hurt others in ways we've known and in ways we haven't known. We are people who have lived lives that have gone against gone against the life our Father wants us to live, that have gone against what we know we should have done, and yet over and over and over again, God has forgiven us. God does not need to forgive us. God gains nothing from forgiving us. God could not forgive us from now until the end of time, and guess what? He would still be God. But because he's God, he offers us forgiveness, each and every single one of us, for the worst of things we have done and for the minute, tiny things we have done wrong. And there are people in your life who are in deep need of that forgiveness. Not because they need to know it, but because you need to. Our God is good. We receive his mercy and his compassion and his love. Let us not be the people who then don't offer it to others. Remove the callous from your heart. Show mercy as your Father has shown mercy. Have forgiveness as our Father offers us forgiveness. And have compassion that people would begin to see that in us. If you'd bow your heads and pray with me. Almighty God, we love you. And this morning, Father, I ask for two things. Lord, I pray that we would know your forgiveness. We would know your mercy. We would know your compassion on our lives in ways that we can see without a shadow of a doubt. Now, Father, we come before you and we just admit, we admit that forgiveness is hard. And so, Lord, 
the power of your Holy Spirit. Break our hearts. Allow us to forgive those who have wronged us. Allow us to forgive those that we hold resentment and grace for. Allow us so freely to just offer forgiveness over and over and over and over again in our lives. And Lord, I had a third thing I pray. I pray for those sirens, wherever they are going, that your spirit and your presence would be moving in front of them. For whatever thing they're going to, that you would bring healing there. Lord, you are a God who is so good. You are present in all things. You are present in the moment that's happening out there. You are present in the moment that's happening in here. And so, Father, we love you and we praise you. May we be a reflection of you to this world that is in need. We pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning we have the opportunity to come to the table, to gather as brothers and sisters in Christ, to break bread and share a cup just as Jesus told us to do. Whether you're new to our church or you've been here a long time, we always want to remind you that this is an open table. What that means is that this table doesn't belong to our church, it belongs to the Lord. And communion is available to each and every single person who wants to come forward and receive it. That's all you have to do. We believe that this is a meal of God's love and God's grace for each and every single person who desires for it. And I pray that this morning especially, you would understand that this is a meal of forgiveness. That on the night in which he gave himself up for us, Christ took the bread and broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. That he would bear the weight of our sins, that he would bear the cost of our sins. The same night he took the cup, he raised it, he gave thanks, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink from this, all of you. We remember that through his work on the cross, Jesus Christ not only broke his body for us, but through the shedding of his blood, our sins have been forgiven. If we but confess them to the Lord. If you'll bow your heads and pray with me. Almighty God, we come before you and we just name before you our sins. We name that we are not perfect people. We might be striving for it, we might be moving towards it, but we aren't there yet, Lord. So we ask for the sins we know and the sins we don't. Lord, in your great mercy and grace that you would forgive us. Let us hear you say, let us taste this morning that we are a forgiven people showered in your love and your grace. We ask that you pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of the field and the vine, that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we would be your body, your hands and feet, redeemed by your blood to serve in this world, to serve our church and our friends and our family, to serve our coworkers, our neighbors, complete and total strangers, to serve the people we love and the people we can't stand. That in some miracle, through our act of servitude, through our act of living for you, Lord, others would come to see your love and your grace. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As those who are assisting would come forward, let me just reemphasize that this is an open table. All are welcome to come. 
When you come forward, you'll receive a small piece of bread. We invite you to dip that lightly into the cup, and you can eat from that. There is a gluten-free option available as well. You just need to tell us when you come forward, and any of our communion servers will help you receive that. As always, our children will take communion first. We believe that communion is available to all and is a sign of God's love and grace, and therefore we do serve communion to children. If you are a parent and you come from a different tradition and you feel a bit uncomfortable with that, now is your time to stop that. But uh, we love love and grace here, and so again, we want everyone to have that. The table is set, the children will come first, and then our ushers will assist you in coming forward. Fleshed out the wonder of life And as you sing A hundred billion galaxies are born The vapor of your breath Stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star is seen a fire of grace. Creation sings your praises, so will I. If the wind knows where you send it 
Church, I invite you to stand as we sing this last song together. Sing all my words. And all my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song must end, and you never do. So I throw my hands, praise you again and again, because all that I have is a heart. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. God done response. I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide.